Muy buenas tardes, eh, bienvenidos. Eh, good evening, welcome to the Instituto Cervantes List and Manchester YouTube channel. First of all, I would like to, to extend a warm welcome to our guests uh, tonight, Professor Paul uh, Julian Smith and Professor Rossi Song. Thank you to our audience for joining us. And uh, this is the first event of uh, our series. Ex Libris publications on Hispanic studies, the first event in 2022, because it's the second uh, year we started with, I am uh, very pleased to say that uh, with a great success. Thank you uh, for the support, Rossi, uh, to, you have been the, the source and you have been made possible this, this series. We are very happy about that. Uh, Professor Rossi Song, who is uh, head, uh, also of the deputy head of the School of uh, Modern Languages at, and Culture at the Doran University. As you might know, some of you, but some might not, uh, the, the aim of this series is to discuss the recent work of a uh, topic of contemporary Hispanic culture in British and uh, in American academia. Uh, first of all, I will introduce now uh, Professor Rossi Song, who is, uh, as I said, uh, Deputy Head of the School of Modern Languages in Doran University. She has published many works on contemporary Spanish culture, film and literature, and uh, some of her uh, publications include uh, Lost in Transition, uh, Constructing Memory in uh, Contemporary Spain, A Taste of Barcelona, the History of Catalan Cooking and Knitting, co-author, uh, a book which was also launched in this uh, channel, not in this series, but in this channel, in Instituto Cervantes. She has also published Tastes of Contamination and Earthing the Franco's Legacy in Contemporary Spanish Discourse and towards the cultural archive of La Movida as co-editor. Her articles have been appearing in the Journal of Spanish Cultural Studies, MLN, Revista de Estudios eh, Hispánicos, Romance Notes, Hispamérica, Revista Iberoamericana, and Hispania, among others. And our second guest, is Paul uh, Gillian Smith, is an internationally recognized uh, scholar of Hispanic and Mexican cultural and media studies and critical theory. He's author of 23 books and over 100 academic articles, and is a distinguished professor at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He has been visited professor in many universities, among others in, the, in Spain, the United States, including Stanford, New York University, and Carlos III in Madrid. He also was elected uh, in uh, 2008 as fellow of the British Academy. As a critic of British uh, film, uh, for British Film sorry, uh, Institute Site and Sound Magazine, Smith has established himself as a world scholar on films on the Spanish director uh, Pedro Almodóvar. His very uh, acclaimed book, Decided and Limited, The Cinema of Pedro Almodóvar, is one of the most widely read books uh, on this uh, uh, international Spanish filmmaker. Just to mention some of the books uh, uh, of the uh, Julian, uh, we can mention um, Writing in the Margins, The Modern, uh, the modern Time, Space and Subjectivity in Contemporary Spanish Culture, Contemporary Spanish Culture, TV, Fashion, Arts and Film, and uh, Spanish vis Visual Culture, Cinema, Television, Internet, among many others, as I said, he has published 30, uh, 23 books, which have been also translated into Spanish, Chinese, and Turkish. His research focused also in Mexico and included a book of Amores Perros, and has served also as a year of the Morelia Film Festival in 2009 and the San Sebastian International Film Festival in 2013. Today, we have the pleasure uh, to have our discussions with, uh, with the center on the launch of the book of Paul uh, Julian Smith, uh, Reimagining History in Contemporary Spanish Media, Theater, Cinema, uh, Television, Streaming, 
which was published in uh, Leyenda in November 2021. In this book, he offers a new perspective via, uh, via the visual culture of the remaining history for contemporary Spanish media audiences. And that will be the topic, the launch, that would be uh, Rossi, who will discuss with Paul Smith, but we can say without any doubt that this book shows how Spanish history is radically reimagined through recent visual culture. Thank you very much, Rossi. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you to our audience. I also want to say that uh, you we will have like uh, 15 minutes at the end of the of the talk uh, for you to put your question in the chat uh, box. And uh, without further ado, tienes la palabra, Rosy Song. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pedro Jesus, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, and I would like to welcome Paul Julian Smith, uh, whose work I follow for such a long time. From and I still remember the first time that I met you in grad school. Uh, oh, so for so you to <laughs> to host you here in this event is such a pleasure and such an honor uh, for me. So welcome, thank you so much, you. Paul, for joining us today. Um, so I know that we heard about your publications and especially about this book. So I just wanted to quickly just. Uh, start asking you um, to briefly introduce your book actually in your own, own uh, words and perhaps along the lines of actually why you wrote this book. Mm -hmm. um, I asked the why because I think that all of your works have really inspired a lot of young scholars to sort of follow on your footsteps because you're always discovering works and authors and directors to study. And you single-handedly sort of created um, a field in visual culture um, in Hispanic studies for us to study. So tell us a bit about this last book and also why you wrote it. Okay, thank you so much. It's, um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I, you know, the pleasure is all mine, as they say. Um, so over the last 10 years, I just noticed that there were diverse texts and different media that are about reproducing the past. And so theater, cinema, TV, and streaming. And this is a kind of distinctive feature of Spanish media. So I just came across this, if you like. For example, I also work on Mexico and in Mexican TV until recently, there was no costume drama in the top 10 TV shows. Mm -hmm. um, and so also I was aware how Spanish period drama on broadcast TV prepared the projection of the country on streaming. Mm -hmm. um, so um, actually, let me just show you the cover of the book. You've mm -hmm. probably seen this already. Yes. Is that OK? So I'm, yes. I'm sorry, this is very expensive. This is the hardback. So don't <laughs> buy it now. Wait for the, the paperback. And also, there will be an e version mm -hmm. uh, later. Um, so the cover is the, a streaming series called Veneno by the Javis, mm -hmm. which was on Atres Media in Spain. And it was the first um, Spanish language show that was pick, picked up by HBO Max in the US. So the case of the Javis, these two young men who made the show is kind of emblematic because they work across several different media. But I still I wanted to insist on the importance of free to air TV to national life because before the pandemic, I would travel a lot to Spain and just turn mm -hmm. on the TV. And I think it's important to experience that, that that medium still is important. And although foreign Hispanists work on cinema, we have to acknowledge that the Spaniards before the pandemic went to movie theaters, to cinemas, maybe three times a year. Mm -hmm. and, and these are overwhelmingly Hollywood films. And yet mm -hmm. they watch four hours of TV every day. And these are locally produced. So if we're talking about what's the nature of everyday life in Spain, then we have to pay attention to what is consumed in the home. And of course, since the pandemic, pretty much everything is consumed in the home. But, but the reason for writing the book, as for most of my work, is simply to share my pleasure in mm -hmm. texts that I think are important, which maybe people are not aware of. And this is just all the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think that your point about the way we consume or the way we engage with this visual culture uh, mm -hmm. is different now. And I wanted to sort of, before we start uh, discussing the different parts of the book and some of the works that you discuss, I actually thought that maybe we should take a moment to familiarize ourselves and, and our listeners with some of the concepts and definitions that you actually 
uh, mentioned in your book as important factors to take into consideration, right? So I was wondering if you could, if we could start a little um, discussing, for example, concepts like intermediality mm -hmm. or why you think about uh, multimedia or why uh, paying attention to streaming platforms is important. Mm -hmm. And also, I think that you discuss um, in some detail uh, or at least invites us to invite us to uh, pay attention to the industrial context of these works. So can we start discussing those three items before we jump into the book? Okay, so in fact, part one of the book is called Multimedia because it includes theater. And so I'm interested in the way in, in content that there is um, a convergence of theme, but uh, but I'm guessing, so convergence culture was a, a phrase coined by Henry Jenkins mm. I mean, some time ago. Um, and so the idea is that there is a blurring of uh, TV, cinema, and streaming, mm. that they all come together because of domestic consumption, but also because of the creative talent, the aesthetics, the same producers. Mm -hmm. So I've often used the term in my work of screen fiction to say it's all audiovisual and, and mm. these categories that used to exist of cinema uh, and TV are no longer useful. And so I think a, an emblematic moment, which I didn't see because I couldn't travel, um, but the, uh, the Javis or the, you know, the, the company, they put a huge poster of Veneno, the same mm -hmm. image that I showed you just now on the cover of the book, on the Gran Via, they hung it from the front. I think it was the Palacio de la Musica, which was mm -hmm. a a movie palace, which has been empty for many years. And the whole of the facade was covered by this image from a streaming series. Mm -hmm. And so what I took that to mean is that TV or streaming has literally and symbolically displaced film from the media center. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just to talk a bit about the industrial aspect, period fiction, costume drama, is a mm -hmm. kind of competitive advantage for Spain in a global market, um, as is drama for women. And so there was mm. a chapter on Spanish shows on Netflix and what do international audiences look for from Spanish shows on streaming platforms, why it's period shows and, and women. Um, and, and for example, in uh, Las Chicas del Cable. Mm -hmm. But I think actually this is a long time coming because I lived in Spain in, um, in Madrid in 2009 and I remember walking down the Gran Via again in those great times when it was so easy to travel. And mm -hmm. there were hordes of screaming teenage fans and they had closed mm -hmm. down the Gran Via outside a cinema. And I thought, what is this? Because it was very commonplace to say Spanish cinema doesn't connect with young audiences. Mm -hmm. There is a crisis in Spanish cinema. And what was this? This was a premiere, but it was a premiere of the second season of Física o Química. Oh, okay. O Química was a TV um, mm -hmm. series. Because yeah. at that time, 2009, everything was free to air, broadcast TV. Um, and it showed how TV connected with local audiences mm. at the same time that cinema didn't. And it had literally displaced uh, cinema mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because this was uh, taking place in a, in a movie theater. And those actors, those creators, both technical, you know, in front mm -hmm. and behind the camera, they went on to make mm. the streaming series which were right. globally distributed. So I wasn't wrong in thinking, this is not just an industrial question, this is a creative artistic question. Okay. Um, and um, so anyway, that's, I felt that because of my experience of living in Spain, where I would, every Friday I would go and see a Spanish film mm. in a cinema in the Gran Vía, and there would be the proverbial cuatro gatos, you know, <laughs> five or six people watching this, this film, which I knew, you know, foreign Hispanists would take seriously, but of course, we should write about cinema. We have, but we'd have to acknowledge that it's not a mass medium in a way that television mm -hmm. and streaming are. Yeah. We could say that you really did have a foresight when you actually wrote television studies uh, so many years ago. You're absolutely been proven right uh, in yeah. a way that television yeah. is really uh, taking a sort of central role, right, in the way that we um, consume culture or connect um, to. Um, our own societies. Um, so can we talk a little bit about the title of your book? So it's not representing history. 
this reimagining history. <laughs> so can you uh, say why not representing, recreating, but actually reimagining? Yeah, I hadn't really thought about this until you, you <laughs> because, hey, this is a secret, but I was sent the questions in advance. Um, <laughs> but that's for the audience there. But um, yeah, so reimagining history, so putting into image. I, I was just, um, I just finished writing a book on the Mexican film, Y Tu Mama Tambien. And the mm. cinematographer of that film talked about resolving the story, which of course is historia in, mm. in Spanish, resolving the story into images. So I wanted to think about how is it that history is resolved into images, mm. reimagined. And so in fact, part two of the book is called TV period pieces because it's right. about mm -hmm. replaying the past of particular decades, especially in the 1920s. But what I wanted to go was Beyond, I assume if we work on audiovisual narrative, we're going to talk about camera work and editing, but mm -hmm. to take seriously other visual resources in reimagining history, which are costume, set design, but also architecture and painting. Mm -hmm. It's nice when you're writing and things come up you're not expecting. And so painting was uh, a kind of motif which, which recurred several times. And um, and then uh, other work I did was on reception of, say, Las mm. Chicas del Cable, okay. mm -hmm. this uh, Netflix series. And, and so I was struck because where, whereas the stress of the press, at least in the US, mm. was on, yeah, was on costume, lipstick mm. and jaunty hats. So, you know, I would, I, I'm all for lipstick and jaunty hats. But, mm -hmm. no, but I mean, that we need to take costume makeup seriously. Mm. Um, but when I looked at, social media, which is supposed to be so trivial and transient, what mm -hmm. I found was a kind of deep emotion by American viewers connecting with the Spanish series. Mm. For example, one said, oh, I, I couldn't watch the last episode. I waited six months because mm. I was too upset to say goodbye to my cable girls. Um, and, and so I was struck by this reimagining re -imagining of history is something that it does connect outside mm. Spain with foreign audiences, and it's a deeply emotional or, or affective um, process. Yeah. Visual process. Visual process. And thinking about sort of that historic historical connection through these period pieces and so on. So let's talk about actual history, right? I mean, one of the things that I think many scholars and including yourself have said is how predominant in our studies has been the history of Spain in the way that the Spanish Civil War and its long legacy, right, uh, is still with us today. Um, the dictatorship, obviously. Yet, uh, in your discussion, one of the arguments that you make is that in comparison, the works, or at least the period that you're looking at, could be said there is a certain absence of these topics, or at least in the traditional way that is they've been treated. Mm -hmm. Yet, you are also able to identify some uh, characters or uh, elements that are connected to that history, and you sort of follow their story. So you talk about Lorca in particular, and the painting Guernica. So how do you think these, these stories or these memories are recovered uh, in this new um, sort of multimedia format. Mm. Okay, thank you. So this is, uh, I, I guess, we, uh, some books that, that I have an idea from the beginning how it's going to develop and others I don't. So I just noticed sort of empirically that there were many um, uh, works which were focused on the 1920s. And I understand from TV studies research, this is not just the case in Spain. Well, think of, um, you know, Downton Abbey. Um, so in Spain, this is thought to be like the happy decade before um, the war. And um, I get a feeling there's, um, I don't have a feeling there is research on this that show the audience in Spain have, have a feeling of exhaustion with discussion mm -hmm. of the civil war and dictatorship. And, the, and they, in fact, it's quite interesting that they believe that more works have been made in this period than were actually made. Um, mm -hmm. But there's, so perhaps a turning away from that after so much. Um, but you're right that I do have, so I'm working on the 1920s and also the 1990s. 
uh, particularly with uh, the Havis. Um, but um, one interesting uh, show, which is not available in the US, and I imagine not in Britain, is Out of the Madrid, mm -hmm. Madrid is Burning, which is the story of Hollywood movies, movie star Ava Gardner in 1960s Madrid. So this is about the dictatorship, but it's mm -hmm. from a very oblique angle because you get this American in the Spanish capital in the 1960s, and it's a comedy. So mm -hmm. I was struck this is a very smart and, uh, and humorous way of addressing mm -hmm. aspects of the dictatorship that maybe we've not seen before. But another one which I like very much and is definitely not available here is La Otra Mirada, which mm -hmm. is broadcast TV. It was made by Televisión Española. Mm -hmm. Televisión Española is often disguised, but this is a costume drama set in the 1920s, which is about a girl's school in Seville. Mm. So it's very beautiful. It has those, you know, the lipstick and jaunty hats, <laughs> but, but it also addresses contemporary social issues. Of course, the balance mm. with any period uh, uh, fiction is to connect with a current audience, which is called presentism. Right. And so I think it's really, I was astonished is that mm -hmm. in this 1920 show, they have a whole plot line about, which is clearly modeled on La Manada, which mm. was a, a recent horrible group rape, right. uh, uh, which took place in, in contemporary Spain. And they are the show on, you know, on mass TV, um, free TV to work through that, that plot line. They also had a special episode for uh, Pride Week, LGBTQ Pride. Mm. And so that shows how broadcast TV still intersects with the life of the nation in a way mm. that streaming probably doesn't, and certainly mm. cinema doesn't. Um, and also sort of taking, it's really interesting not to take history into present time, but actually taking present time into history. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a really interesting sort of movement there um, mm -hmm. and actually taking the distance to work these sort of traumatic experiences through. I really like that, that, that what you just said. Um, so one of the other things that I noticed reading this book is that by sort of uh, following this, um, for, uh, for example, the, the life of Lorca or Guernica or sort of this historical um, uh, um, takes or, or looks, you also are able to follow a lot of um, work of other scholars. And I really like the way you sort of establish conversations with them and especially with television studies, right? So you actually not engage with work uh, by um, scholars working in US academia, you mentioned, or UK, you mentioned Alberto Mira, Elena Cotacin, David George. Um, and also, actually, you include um, uh, scholars working in Spain, like Manuel Palacio, Concepcion Cas uh, Cascajosa, and Charo Lavalle, and you really integrate in that sort of discussion about what they're reading about uh, these, uh, these kind of works. Um, so I was wondering if we could talk about the importance or the significance of these TV uh, period pieces. And actually, uh, one of the frameworks that you use actually has to do with Mili Bonanno's Sceneggiato, which I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, yeah. uh, which I think has a, it has a certain distinction from the way we traditionally thought about these biopic pieces. Uh, and I'm thinking these uh, period pieces, sorry, not biopic, but period pieces. And I'm thinking more sort of uh, one could think about British period pieces, for example. And, and I have this feeling that when you talk about the Spanish ones, uh, you are talking about something a little bit more, uh, a little bit different, right? So can you uh, tell us a little bit more about your um, understanding of these TV period pieces as part of this Spanish sort of cultural uh, production? Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. So if we could start by thinking about my sources, I, mean, I think as a kind of almost an ethical question, you have to, if you're writing about Spain, you need to address what Spanish scholars are saying. And um, so, um, but then you have to acknowledge the institutional differences. The Spanish scholars are working in communication uh, departments mm -hmm. and the kind of work they do tends to be different, but it's extremely valuable work. So someone like Charo Lacalle has books on the representation of youth or immigrants on Spanish TV. 
And so she will de deal talking about immigration with mm -hmm. 300 episodes of series. In, and so far in his minutes tend to work on maybe four or five feature films. Mm. It, it's a much huger corpus. And as I said before, one interacts much more closely with everyday life for mm -hmm. Spanish audiences. So what we can do as foreigners then is maybe draw on that quantitative material yes. and, and do qualitative readings because we have more of a tradition in the humanities of close readings. And, and I guess I'm trying to combine that. Now, in the particular case of the, this is the only chapter which is about material which isn't from the last 10 years. Yes. Is I have a chapter on the so-called classic serial, Serie Classica, mm -hmm. as a kind of pioneer of convergence. And the case study is Fortunati y Jacinta, yes. uh, which was the television of the transition, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which was also presentist. And it was presenting Galdós as a democratic writer and yeah. educating Spaniards on the rights and responsibilities of democracy. But I thought the connection was not so much with the UK, although in fact they did see uh, the Foresight Saga, which mm -hmm. was 67, I think, that was dubbed and shown on Spanish TV, but with Italy, because there are parallels between Italy and Spain around debates around nation formation mm -hmm. and education through quality TV series. And you mentioned Mili Buonanno, who is mm -hmm. a sort of doyen of European TV studies. And what she is arguing for a different model of quality TV, because quality TV in the US is seen as boundary pushing. You know, mm -hmm. it's those series which push the envelope of both thematically and uh, formally, beginning, mm -hmm. say, with The Sopranos, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where they were showing things on TV that had never been seen before. And she's arguing for a new respect for a European version of quality TV, which would be literary mm -hmm. and is not despised for being literary, but rather um, should be welcomed because it's a different kind of, of media convergence. And so I did reading around Shene Giato, mm -hmm. which as you say is the, what Titanis at that time called Serie Classica. And I discovered mm -hmm. that Spaniards were indeed influenced by, by Italian um, mm -hmm. sort of biopics of great men that kind of thing by a series rather and um so i thought it would be interesting to make that connection rather than always making a connection with let's say britain although the bbc model remains mm -hmm. uh, very um, influential as public service in europe or with the us and the quality tv or complex tv model which used to be in um, um cable and, and now is in streaming maybe Mm. I actually really enjoyed your discussion of Fortunata y Jacinta as a sort of form of presentism and sort of weaving the conversations about uh, the transition. And um, yeah, I, I never thought of it in, in those terms because I always saw it as sort of this period piece. And then it's like, of course, oh, that makes so much more sense. <laughs> so thank you for that chapter, actually. Oh, you're welcome. So, yeah, so let's leave a bit of history and let's get back to sort of some of these um, uh, characters or perhaps topics that get through, appear through the, the book and uh, and they're the Javis. So let's talk about the Javis, uh, Javi Calvo, Javi Ambrosi. Um, and I think that you really tell a very interesting story uh, about creativity, about knowing the medium and so on. So can you, Perhaps for those who do not, um, I, I doubt that there, are not, that there are people here in the audience that have not heard about the Javis, but just in case, uh, can you explain who the Javis are and why do you think they're so interesting uh, right now? Okay, thank you. So I think they're probably the most important creators in Spain at the moment, because precisely because of media convergence that... Um, so a few years ago in Spain, I, in Madrid, I went to see La Llamada, which is mm -hmm. their um, crazy musical um, in, in, in the theater, you know, but it's actually, this, this is theater as mass medium because it's been seen by hundreds of thousands of people and it was mm -hmm. exported as far as Mexico. And it's very reminiscent of, of Almodovar and it's, a, you know, there were, you know, singing nuns and crazy young girls and a lesbian theme. So if you know, Enter the Nieblas, the early mm -hmm. Almodovar film. This is like a, a rerun of that almost. So the Javis moved, uh, uh, Javier Calvo was an actor on Physical Chimica, this um, 
seminal TV show, uh, teen TV show. Mm -hmm. And then they made a film of La Llamada, which was um, uh, nominated uh, for prizes. But what I'm struck by is that that is their only feature film to date, that they, whereas once one would think that the ambition is to, is to make feature films, it's the most prestigious uh, medium, but they didn't. They made Paquita Salas, which was a, a comedy, a mock documentary comedy, mm. very localist, uh, set in Getafe, uh, Herodes, as if any of you, and there's a certain university which is, is in Getafe, so a post-industrial suburb of Madrid. Mm. So it's full of very precise Spanish references. Um, but then when I, two years ago, or three years ago now, when I could, when I went to hear the Javis give a talk in Madrid, actually in the Telefonica building, which is supposedly the setting for Chicas del Cable. Mm. And they spoke the, uh, about their pleasure that it was a series that through Netflix had become popular in places uh, like South Korea, was one mm. that they mentioned, where, of course, they wouldn't get any of the local references at all. Um, so I said this is a mock documentary, but very knowing about its, uh, references to uh, Spanish television and so on. And then they made Veneno, and which is kind of really a step up. So Veneno is a very complex and sophisticated, as well as funny and moving bio series um, about. So what's extraordinary is that they took a figure from the 1990s who was a transgender woman who became a star on late night television. Mm -hmm. So these are so many ways in which uh, this woman known as Veneno was marginal. Mm -hmm. She began as a sex worker. And they can make a series on this. And in the LA Times, they said, this is the global TV sensation. Uh, so it's really um, extraordinary that they were able to take very local material and through their artistry, transform it into something of universal uh, relevance. But what I was uh, struck by is that it's not a simple bio series. Mm -hmm. It's a story about the writing of a biography and so it's right almost seven time in that complexity mm -hmm. because you have a, um, a kind of fictitious author well, based on a real person, but located within the mm -hmm. text of, of the film, of the series. Um, um, and so they moved through these different media um, in a way which is really, um, I think, exemplary. And one thing I refer to in, in the book is a little promotional video where Paki de Salas you have to imagine you haven't seen it. She's played by a man, but she's a, you know, a little fat Spanish woman. And she goes to the Netflix headquarters in California. And this is a very kind of daring and crazy improvisational comedy. And she asked to meet the boss of Netflix, Reed Hastings, because now her show is on Netflix. Why shouldn't she? Mm -hmm. And the only words of English she knows are meeting and boss. And so there's... <laughs> <laughs> there are a series of short videos which follow her as she makes her way into this, mm. you know, hugely powerful institution, which is Netflix and its uh, uh, headquarters this time in Los Angeles, not in Los Gatos, which is their original mm -hmm. one. Um, so there's an ironic reflection here, very typical of the Javis, on a kind of Spanish inferiority complex. Mm -hmm. I mean, often in the show that you see the characters, which is set in the entertainment industry in right. Madrid mm -hmm. or in Getafe, and they're struggling to pronounce words like hashtag and mm -hmm. management. <laughs> so it's, it's ironizing against Spain. It really is a double-edged joke because mm -hmm. the Spanish audiovisual industry is so effective at an international level and on digital platforms. Mm -hmm. And so what Netflix wants from Spain, and they've built their European headquarters, outside Madrid, it's called mm -hmm. Content City, which interests me as a name, Content, mm -hmm. because content could be anything, film, right, TV, right. streaming. Mm -hmm. Why Content City in Madrid and not in London or in Paris, Rome? Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the Spaniards are so advanced and have such mm -hmm. a tradition of um, uh, professional audiovisual uh, production. Um, but, but what I... Uh, Enjoy for the chapter on Netflix. It's the first time I've written on American reception. And mm. ironically, this is because the Institute of Cervantes here asked me to do that mm. as a British Hispanist. I, <laughs> I, I thought I'm not the best person to write about American reception. But, um, but I did research. And so I was, as I said before, I was very pleased to see how 
this very specific uh, Spanish mm. series connected with American audiences who, for the first time, had the possibility of, of seeing them in mm -hmm. that, as you know, I mean, foreign language film, foreign language yeah. cinema in America is, is tiny. I mean, it was very mm -hmm. specialized. And on broadcast TV, you never, ever see a, a foreign language series. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a new opportunity for um, producers like Bamboo. So Bamboo has spent, spent 20 years making shows for Spanish TV like Gran Hotel. Gran mm -hmm. Hotel, you know, a, a lovely series um, set around 1900. It was exported to Mexico. They made a, a, a version there. So they had a certain level of success. They're based in Galicia, which is also interesting. They're not based mm -hmm. in Madrid or Barcelona. And now suddenly they have a global audience and, and right. they go on to make Las Chicas del Cable. Mm -hmm. We're talking about anachronism. I mean, even in Las Chicas del Cable, which would seem to be very reliant on a period mise-en-scene, from yeah. the very first episode, they have contemporary music. Mm. I mean, modern music. Yeah. They don't yeah, use yeah. music in the 20s, mm. which I find I don't like because it kind of drags me out of my uh, stupid absorption in, in mm. the series, um, in the fictional world. But uh, but even in something like Las Chicas del Cable, there is a, um, a an acknowledgement of anachronism mm. within a period series, which is, I think, of, of interest. Yeah. So what do you think the Javis will sort of expand their careers, like having made this sort of kind of work, um, just playing a little bit sort of, I don't know, um, the role of, you know, um, adivinador, perhaps, you know, where do you think this sort of trend going, if we can? Yeah, but they have, they have made another series since, which I'm afraid mm -hmm. I haven't seen, so I can't talk to that. But mm -hmm. what I was uh, interested in was that they were on the equivalent of America's Got Talent or whatever, you know, the, mm. a, a reality contest show on Televisión Española as well. They were there as judges. This is a couple mm. of years back. But as a, a very openly gay couple, and I think this is, is also a novelty. Mm. So I'm, I'm struck by the way they can move within different genres and different registers because mm -hmm. Veneno is a tragedy, really. I mean, it ends mm. with the funeral actually i think it's called the three funerals of veneno so they give multiple versions again mm -hmm. a bit like cervantes there is a kind of perspectivism here but this is something of high seriousness mm -hmm. and yet they're willing to sort of apparently demean themselves and appear mm -hmm. for millions of people on network network tv um, but so i not i i mind them very much for uh for adapting and and, mm -hmm. and also for making the marginal, the queer central mm. in, in yes. Spanish media. And one thing that's very, actually rather reminiscent of Amadova also with yeah. them is, you know, I met them through Concepcion Cascajosa, thank mm -hmm. you, Conchi. They're very aware of the press. They're very skillful in their relations mm. with the press and social media. So this is something that maybe you might think of Spanish film directors say might be scornful of social media. Yeah. Uh, but they, the, the Javis, they, they know how to use that in their, in their own interests and to promote their creative vision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And also, I, I know that uh, actually I want to leave some time for um, questions yeah. uh, from the audience since we already have a couple in the comments. So I'm going to skip sort of the mentioning of this, um, the series that you already talk about in your book, like uh, the Ministerio del Tiempo, which I know that a lot of the audience probably knows about, Las Chicas del Cable, La Casa de Papel, and so on. And since you already talked about Las Chicas del Cable a little bit uh, through this conversation, I feel that we've covered a bit of that. So let's finish our part talking about this idea that you actually also formulate, which is a Spanish audio, audio, um, audiovisual legacy. Um, and I was very uh, struck by this idea of thinking about that legacy and how you present in the book, uh, not precisely because it is about that legacy in that final part, which you actually call Coda, and actually you talk about Almodovar's uh, Dolor y Gloria, uh, but also it is something that you mentioned from the very beginning of the book. So it feels like you're also tracing that idea of the legacy through the many 
parts and chapters of this book. So I wanted to hear a little bit more about this legacy. What do you think it is? Um, how we should perhaps examine it or how could we identify it? Um, yeah, and what's more work to be done? Mm, no, thank you. So audiovisual legacy. Um, and so I guess immediately we would think about the classic serial and that this is Fortunati mm -hmm. Jacinta is still available online and um, has been, you know, been watched for, for, for 50 years. And it's, um, uh, and it refers back to the prestige of literature and high culture. I mean, it's very quite surprising to see the credits of Fortunati Jacinta because mm. it's just a picture of Galdos with his cat. <laughs> for a very long time a, a photograph and and so it's as if television is authorized by literature mm. uh, so that's a very obvious way in which there's the legacy although my argument as you said is that in fact Fortunata was of its time and directed mm. towards its time namely the transition but one thing I'm struck by about the audiovisual archive if you like is how it's already embedded in technology and one thing the Javis do is uh, in uh, shows like Paquita Salas and Veneno is they offer a history of means of reproduction. Mm. The first episode of Paquita is about a lost email, but there is a, a sort of 1990s episode of Paquita where they recreate the look of the time. And it's a question of a lost fax. We have forgotten faxes, perhaps, except in the American medical industry where they still use faxes go to the doctor in America and see a fax machine. Um, uh, or there's, a, a, in the same episode, a Sony Walkman. In mm -hmm. Veneno, there's a, a lot of close-ups of primitive mobile phones with this kind of clunky games. So on the one hand, uh, the audiovisual legacy is always embedded in technology. Yeah. But also, um, uh, there's a kind of respect for a past that is already mediatized. And so the Harrys have a a very moving episode in Paquita Salas where Paquita goes back to her village for the funeral of her mother. Mm -hmm. And they, this is very clearly a reworking of La Casa de Bernada Alba. Mm -hmm. So that these TV comedians can take on Lorca and the most kind of grueling and, and grave work by Lorca, Seven Mourning Women in a Rural House. This is kind of extraordinary. So that there is... I guess we should think of the audiovisual legacy as being a resource which is which is mm. there embedded in technology, but which is available to be recreated uh, for new new technologies um, in ways that are endlessly surprising. Mm -hmm. And what's Almodovar's role in all this? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or do we well, need another hour for so that? Huge, yeah. <laughs> because he is so much. I remember at least 10 years ago, I was in touch with, with El Deseo and, and, and the then financial director. And he said, our business is, the, uh, is Pedro's legacy. Mm -hmm. They didn't say we make films. They're already thinking about what his legacy would be. Uh, and so there's, they've always been so canny about, about marketing, but they are, and with reason, that they, they want to preserve his legacy. And you can see that in a film like Dolore Gloria, which is a sustained meditation on his work and, yeah. and his life. But in the book, I want to make the connections via the theme of aging with mm. between personal individual history and collective national history and, and how they intersect in, in perhaps painful or, or delightful ways. It could be both. And there I'm very moved to see the aging of the actors, particularly yes. Julieta Serrano. I think mm. there she was in 1983 in Entre Tinieblas, and now mm. she's again 40 years later mm. uh, playing Pedro's mother. And it's, wow, it's, it's kind of amazing the way in which, to this, this extent, I mean, I, I guess we could read um, Amadou's filmography as a, a TV series. And, yes. and so the new episode comes out. Maybe every two years. <laughs> it used to be annual. Now it's every two years. Now there are clear, there's a clear seriality and enrichment mm. of each new episode by the ones that have gone before them. Uh, yeah. That's that's a really interesting take on sort of Almodovar's 
work. So anyway, let's finish here our conversation and open uh, the floor to questions, our virtual floor. And I actually have a couple of questions already here. So I'm going to read this to you, Paul. So Paul, uh, Pablo Schiff um, asks, in the case of Los Javis and the production side of Veneno, what can be said about its transnational aspect? It started as an original production of the streaming service of Antena 3, and it came to Argentina and Latin America as a promotional tool of that platform. Two episodes were shown, and after a few months, HBO bought the rights, including distribution. Is American Giant always a shadow? Mm. Well, thank you so much. And um, so, uh, well, um, uh, Pablo, that's great that I did, didn't know about the distribution history of Veneno in, in Argentina and indeed in Mexico. I, I don't know what it is. I don't know in Britain. Is it available to be seen in, in Britain, um, Rosy? I actually have not checked it, but no. um, yeah, because I saw Paquita Salas is on in Netflix Spain. here. And then I, I finished the series in the UK. So it is available in Netflix. Yeah. I'm not sure about Veneno, which I, I, yes, you know, as I was finishing the book, I was making mm. mental notes to watch it. So because I will let you know. But there's this kind of fragmentation of, um, of, um, of access, even within the United States. For example, I don't have HBO. And, and so I cannot watch Veneno here, but I saw it um, because I had a, I had a private link, if you like, um, which are the advantages of being a, being a critic. But I don't think it's the case that the United States is controlling this. I mean, working TV studies has shown that there is, and, and Pablo's um, work is about this, that there are triangulations between uh, Latin America, Europe, and even uh, the Middle East, uh, with the work circulates in different ways. And the old idea of cultural imperialism, that the US controls the distribution of audiovisual goods is no longer the same. Mm -hmm. So, um, as you say, it was uh, then it was made for Art Tres Media, and I think the distribution in Spain is interesting because even during the pandemic, that there was I was talking about the Gran Vía, the mm -hmm. first two episodes were shown. They were projected in a cinema on the Gran Vía, so they put partook of the residual prestige of of, of, of cinema. Mm. Uh, the uh, uh, distribution history of Paqui de Salas is even more interesting because it began on his Instagram as very brief skits and then it went to a, a little known uh, digital provider in Spain and from then to Antena Tres, which is one of the two great media conglomerates and then was picked up by Netflix. But I think there's a great randomness in here because I have friends who are producers in, in Mexico and they have experience of talking to Netflix and trying to pitch projects to them and from what they tell me, it is completely random. Mm. Because I had uh, a friend pitched a science fiction series uh, to Ted Sarandos, who's the head of content. And he said, we don't want science fiction from Latin America. <laughs> I don't know why not, but that was his position that time. And the next year, they had a Brazilian science fiction mm. series. So my friend was rather put out that he had told mm. her that. Um, so distribution is complex and I'm, yeah, I'm concerned because of this, I'm not sure if I can say this, balkanization that everything is splitting up and even within a single territory, whether you get to see things or not is, mm -hmm. whether you're subscribed to multiple platforms. Um, I think it's very unlikely that they, I told you when I saw, heard the Javi speak, they were very pleased that the, uh, the Paquita had worked even in Asia mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They certainly had not planned the series for distribution um, in uh, globally. Uh, but one thing that um, they were they were talking about their own influences, and their own influences are, are very broad. And that's not just it's partly it's partly American TV, but it's also mm -hmm. things like uh, uh, 10%, uh, the, which is "Call My Agent" in yeah. English, is a, a, a cinema a, a t French TV series about. Um, agents uh, uh, in which famous actors and actresses play themselves. And, and this is clearly an influence on Becky de Salas. Um, but this is moving in many different ways, I think. Um, and, we'll have and to... Pablo, sorry. Yes. Um, Spanish TV industry connections with Latin America, Europe, and the US. So there have been several Spanish TV formats, formats which have been exported either to Mexico, but it didn't work, in fact. Um, 
Grand Hotel in Mexico didn't work. Uh, mm. There were very few period shows in Mexico compared to Spain, which is one reason I read the book. Mm. I thought Spain is good on doing costume drama. Um, and there were two uh, Spanish shows, which were the format was exported to the US and they were also failures. Uh, mm. So it's fine. That makes it all the more extraordinary. The actual Spanish shows, Las Chicas del Cable, work in the US on streaming mm. when on old fashioned broadcast TV, the formats didn't work, even when they were adapted by American producers to supposedly connect with an American audience. Um, mm. So we do have some uh, people here, our commenters. Actually, Abby said that Veneno is not mm. available in the UK, but mm. we can subscribe to address player to watch it. So thank okay. you. Uh, I'd just like to say that uh, Abigail Loxham is a great pioneer of yes. TV studies in Britain. So I salute her. This is me yes. saluting. <laughs> yes. Sorry, I did ma meant to man mention actually Abigail and also so, uh, Sally Faulkner, whose work you also work, um, wow. you comment in your book. Um, and also Robert Bailey says Beneno is on HBO Max in the US, he thinks. Yeah, this is. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, so, it's, it was the first Spanish language series to be picked up by HBO Max. Oh. So this is a great honor, I think, mm. for the hobbies and for Spain. We have one more question from Pablo, and he said, on thinking about Spanish TV industry, what are its connections with Latin America, Europe, and the US? Mm. I think I was trying to, yeah, I tried to answer that a bit before in the... Um, mm. But what's interesting is I think there are now producers who are working in, in, in the US as well. But why would they bother? Because if you think of La Casa de Papel, Money mm. Heist, yes. it's a global show. I mean, it was the last season is shot all over the world. So it's no longer, you know, the characters have names like Tokyo, uh, but it really is shot everywhere. And so mm. why would those uh, producers who have kind of infinite budgets with Netflix, they have no reason to work in the United States really. But there are producers who've gone over to work in, in, in the US. Uh, but I think um, sometimes I, I believe it's a surprise for HBO that, uh, sorry, for, for Netflix that La Casa de Papel was, in, they had one season on Smash TV, it was canceled, and then it was picked up by um, Netflix and, and it became a huge hit. Um, mm. And um, so those. I mean, it's, it's interesting if you watch the making of uh, Money Heist. It's really a terrible title in English, Money Heist. What other heist is that? As this dual heist. Anyway, yeah. La Casa de Papel is a, a very um, resonant title. And, and so, as I say, they were not making a show for an international audience, but that's how it turned out. Yeah. But if you... And oh, this is an interesting thing about connections between Spain and Latin America. So these shows are not dubbed into so-called neutral Spanish. Neutral Spanish is actually Mexican, but with the Mexicanismos taken out. So you can't say guajolote or, or chelas. You have to say pavo and cerveza. Um, so this is new for Latin American audiences to see Spanish shows with very Castilian accents and and locutions, which are not often were not welcomed. And so mm. this is an anecdote I think I mentioned in the book. And when I used to go to Mexico City, there were dedicated stores selling pirate TV series. Again, this was relatively new, not movies at all, only TV series. Mm. And so I asked for, I was going to ask for uh, uh, La Casa de las Flores. It's a telenovela parody, Mexican show. Uh, uh, made for, for Netflix. And I just asked this guy, La Casa de, and he said, La Casa de Papel, Casa de Papel. And he wanted to sell me a Spanish show in the center of Mexico City. So this shows how this fluidity of, uh, of movement, even through illegal pirated DVDs um, for uh, European Spanish um, uh, content in Latin America. Uh, and I'm not sure if it works the other way around. Um. Mm. So it's interesting to think about how global also this market is. I'm just thinking about Netflix playing such a big role in Asia, for example, right? Um, with a global sensation of the Squid Game, basically, yeah. which is, yeah. 
I think that's similar because I understand that Squid Game was it was not expected to be a success. Mm, yes, it and wasn't. From at all. what I read in in Variety, that in the local press, that um, in in Korea, people said, "Oh, we've seen this before. It's, there's nothing new." Whereas when it came out, I mean, I watched. It, I was kind of amazed. It seemed to be totally new because of mm. my absolute ignorance of Korean audiovisual. Um, so perhaps this is also the case with uh, uh, La Casa de Papel. Um, mm where there are, for Spanish viewers, there are, in the first season at least, there are very familiar locations, the Gran Vía again, mm -hmm. uh, whereas to, to foreign audiences, it's all new and exciting. Mm -hmm. Right. I also heard um, that um, suddenly um, senior actors in Korea are very in demand for Netflix shows <laughs> after Squid Game. <laughs> oh, great, yeah. <laughs> Yes. So. I, know, I know they they came to LA promoting the, the series. Yeah. It didn't need any promoting. It was the number exactly. one show. Yeah, uh, that's very interesting. Every day uh, I would turn on my Netflix and say number one Squid Game, <laughs> and uh, and I have to say that I I loved it. But I I'm not sure this is happening in in the UK now. But what's interesting is that the streaming platforms have gone back to the old kind of um, episodic uh, release of. Uh, you know, of, of each week you get maybe two episodes, mm. two new episodes, rather than putting the whole thing um, to binge in yeah. one go. So that was mm. kind of return of the repressed, which was weekly TV scheduling, but now right. on uh, uh, digital platforms. Mm. So one of the, of the uh, the attractiveness of this platform is that you can binge. So if you take mm. the binge element out, yeah. um yeah, that's really interesting. For example, yeah, the new series here on on also on a, on Amazon, um, mm -hmm. Mrs. Maisel, two mm -hmm. new episodes every Friday. So they they're clearly they discovered that people are nostalgic for that form of, mm -hmm. of weekly distribution. Yeah. yeah, so it's a one more than one more than one because yeah. one will be too short, so two is, <laughs> and three will be too much, you know, yeah. golosos. Uh, so Avi also says that Carlo is also on Atlas Player and oh, yeah. it is excellent. So uh, thank you, uh, Avi, yeah, for Carlo that. Carlo is the Javi's new series, which I haven't mm. seen. Sorry. So now we, we know what to do. Are there any other questions? I'm not seeing anything in the comments, but if somebody wants to unmute themselves and ask a question, please. Uh, oh. We can have some um, participation. If we want, I, I would like to ask you both uh, because you are professors and you work with the students who are learning or improving the knowledge of the Spanish culture. Do you use the the series, the the Spanish series, uh, with your students as a working material for a deeper knowledge of uh, of the Spanish culture, the Spanish society? Paul, I think you okay. you should. <laughs> well, I I, uh, I have taught um, certainly I've I've taught uh, Spanish series. I mean, I should say I work in a, in the graduate center, so these are postgraduate students. Um, the situation in Britain is rather different in they're mainly English students, and and you're teaching them the knowledge of Spain, which they don't have. Um, undergraduates in the United States, of course, most of them know Spanish, and, and the huge number of them are Latinx. Um, um, one thing that uh, uh, the Instituto Cervantes in, it was actually in Harvard that I wrote that piece for originally as a lecture, and they wanted to know if Spanish series, series from Spain, worked to help uh, the promotion of the Spanish language mm. in the United States. And I did find some evidence for that in social media. Indeed, people, fans of, of Cable Girls saying, I want to learn Spanish so I can I can understand mm. the original dialogue, and most people are saying I can't stand the English dub. I, I want to watch in the Spanish with subtitles, even though I don't know Spanish. So there is a certain evidence for promotion of Spanish language, mm. which of course is the job of the Instituto Cervantes via these series in a way that probably cinema didn't have because cinema foreign language cinema was very niche in the United States and only reached a certain educated elite audience. Um, in my experience, I've used parts of it. So, for example, I remember teaching a 19th century novel course, and um, I knew that for students, um, 
a lot of descriptions that were in these novels uh, were a little bit sort of foreign. So I actually had created sort of an after class club and we watched Fortunata y Jacinta because I couldn't really assign the reading of it. And actually it was really interesting as sort of a vocabulary exercise because uh, things in the house, like for example, the lamps, the tables and, and things that, that were being described in the novel, they could see it. So I would stop, for example, the episodes, like remember that that's the word, that's what, what it means. And, and it really, I think that students really were able to capture sort of that idea of that time um, that then they sort of, took it uh, in the in the novels that we're reading, which were much shorter because we couldn't really read Fortunata Jacinta. The other uh, one that I really use uh, um, and actually was very useful, especially to connect Spain with Latin America, I think that as uh, Paul is saying that in the US when you teach, you have a lot of Latinx students and sometimes teaching about Spain can be a bit sort of hard to sell. So Vientos de Agua, actually, sort of the going back and forth in Latin America um, TV series about migration uh, in the past and in the present uh, seems to resonate a lot uh, with students. So that was, for example, uh, for me at least, um, a rather uh, successful uh, um, tool uh, for teaching. Um, I haven't done something like that in the UK uh, system yet. Uh, I'm very new here, but I'm sure that I'll find opportunities to explore. Uh, I think I'm going to finish here. Uh, thank you so much, Paul, uh, for your time, for your generosity, Generosity. for your work. Uh, Thank you, uh, Pedro Jesus, for hosting us again. Uh, I want to remind our listeners that we're going to be back on May 17th with our second guest, and that will be Eugenia Afino Genova and her book on the Prado Prado Museum. So hope we can see many of you back. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Rossi. It was wonderful uh, uh, dialogue, and we have learned. I have learned a lot with you. Thank you very much. It was really brilliant. Thank you.